All right, thanks, Vincent. What's up, guys? It's time to keep this learning momentum going. What's up, biochemistry babies? I'm Nikki. Welcome to my video. We're gonna be going over 27.5. We're gonna be talking about food intake and starvation and how they induce metabolic changes. It's gonna be awesome. Get ready, get your textbooks out, get your notes ready. Let's do it. Let's say it's Monday night. You just cooked up a nice big dinner. You got some steak, you got some greens, you got everything you need. Then you go to bed, take a big old sleep, wake up at 10 a.m. It's Tuesday morning. So you wake up, cook yourself a big old breakfast. But what happens overnight when you're not intaking any food? How does that work? All right, so start off, there are three stages to this metabolic process. We're gonna talk about the well-fed or the post-prandial stage. So let's take Jason Moa for a second. He eats his steak, he eats his greens. Um, all right, so the next step, the glucose and the amino acids from that food, they get taken out of the intestine, absorbed, put back into the blood, as well as the dietary lipids. And these guys actually get packaged as chylomicrons. Awesome, they also go back into the blood. And they get transported into the blood by the lymphatic system. This all triggers the increase of insulin secretion. Insulin secretion is actually super awesome. This can help trigger, trigger the fed state. It also stimulates glycogen synthesis in both the muscle and the liver. also trigger glycolysis in the liver which then ups the fatty acid synthesis these are all good things it also decreases gluconeogenesis in the liver and upregulates protein synthesis moving on let's talk about the liver a little bit more closely so the liver actually takes up excess glucose and stores it stores it as like gly glycogen to later release once it's released, it's released as glucose once again, and this is all when glucose is really scarce and we're not taking anything in. It's kind of similar to what's happening with toilet paper right now. The liver is able to store these large quantities of glucose. Because of an enzyme known as glucokinase. We've actually talked about this guy when talking about glycolysis. Related to hexokinase, it's actually an isozyme. And it's most active when there is a high concentration of blood glucose. And does not get inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, kind of like how glucose, uh, or sorry, hexokinase is. So, more glucose 6-phosphate, this can trigger glycogen synthase. As well as insulin secretion. Up those glycogen stores. All right, so let's talk about phosphorylase A. Phosphorylase A for a second. It's a glucose sensor, in addition to also being the enzyme that cleaves glycogen. So when glucose levels are high, it actually binds to phosphorylase A, and it is converted to phosphorylase B. Phosphorylase B cannot readily degrade glycogen. So there's a big difference between the two. This means glucose allosterically shifts the glycogen system from a degraded system to a synthetic one. These increased insulin levels in the fed state can result in a bunch of things. First of all, the glucose can then enter the muscle and the adipose tissue. When it enters the muscle, it can lead to um, glycogen storage. And when it enters adipose tissue, it provides glycerol 3 phosphate for the synthesis of the triacylglycerols, which is very important. We'll talk about that later. Insulin also stimulates the synthesis of glycogen by both the muscle and the liver. It also extend, it also um, inhibits protein degradation. We'll tag along with that. It can stimulate the synthesis of extending amino acids and protein metabolism by promoting the uptake of branched chain amino acids. And this is all done by muscle. So, to cut it short, 
In this case, more insulin can lead to more gains. During the early fasting state, also known as the post-absorptive state, blood glucose concentrations can decrease, being that we're not taking in anything. So, we see a decrease in insulin and an increase in glucagon secretion by the pancreatic alpha cells. And their main target is actually the liver, and this also signals the starve state. The glucagon signals that starve state, which then mobilizes the glycogen stores for breakdown, which then inhibits glycogen stores for the breakdown, which then inhibits glycogen synthesis by triggering the camp cascade. And this inhibits fatty acid synthesis by diminishing the production of pyruvate and phosphorylating acetyl-CoA carboxylase. The system also stimulates gluconeogenesis in the liver and blocks glycolysis by lowering that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. I apologize for running off the page. All right, so in summary, the main job of glucagon is to increase the release of glucose by the liver, which then enters the blood, which then enters the muscle and adipose tissue. But with a decrease in blood glucose concentration, the muscle and the liver both have to use fatty acids as fuel to leave glucose for the brain and red blood cells. This concentration needs to be kept up to about 4.4 millimolars. All right, so talking about the liver, when the glycogen stores in the liver are depleted, gluconeogenesis uses lactate and alanine. And this is, of course, from glucose that's already been broken apart. Um, so the brain fully oxidizes glucose to CO2 and water. So we need other carbon sources. One of these found in glycerol from adipose tissue during lipolysis. Another from the hydrolysis of muscle proteins which is very scary and can lead to serious problems. Let's move on to the refed state of the metabolism. After a full breakfast, glucose first enters other tissues, but not the liver, not quite yet. The liver is in fact in still gluconeogenic mode. And once the tissues are replenished, that new excess glucose is used to fill the glycogen stores of the liver. And once fully restored, it can begin to process the excess glucose to fatty acid synthesis. All right, so now let's talk about metabolic adaptation due to prolonged starvation and how we minimize protein degradation. Let's take a 70 kilogram man is about two-thirds of what Jason Momoa is. In an average day, he has about 161,000 kilocals of storage. And in about a 24-hour period, his energy needs meet 1,600 to 6,000 kilocalories. And this is activity dependent. This means the stored fuels would last anywhere from one to three months of starvation. But carbohydrate reserves, of course, would be exhausted in days' time. When under starvation, the blood glucose concentration must be maintained above 2.2 millimolars. In this glycerol moiety of triacylglycerol can be converted to glucose, but this is a limited source.
So carbon skeletons of amino acids derived from the breakdown of proteins can also be used. Let's talk about the goals of metabolism here. The number one goal is to provide the brain and the red blood cells with glucose. The number two goal is to preserve protein and muscle function. So we have to shift fuels. If we lose muscle, we lose function. We can't run away from the tiger when we're pregnant. All right, moving on. On day one of starvation, we see a lot like what we talked about with the overnight fast earlier. We see a decrease in blood sugar, a decrease in insulin secretion, and an increase in glucagon secretion. So we see a mobilization of triacylglycerols from the adipose tissue. And gluconeogenesis activated in the liver. The liver is powered by the oxidizing of fatty acids from adipose tissue, in fact. These steps may for an increase in acetyl-CoA and citrate. These both turn off glycolysis. And the intake of glucose by muscle is diminished due to low insulin levels, while fatty acids can enter freely. So muscles now use no glucose. So fatty acids, as we were saying, enter the muscle freely. And the beta oxidation of these fatty acids inactivates pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And when it halts the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, since acetyl-CoA is st stimulated, the phosphorylation of pyruvate dehydrogenase, we see an increase in pyruvate, lactate, and alanine. All three of these head to the liver and can be converted to glucose. A quick note, another raw material will be glycerol from the cleavage of triacylglycerols. All right, so we're gonna talk about muscle loss. It must be minimized, as we were saying, to maintain function of the organism. On day three of starvation, the liver begins to form ketone bodies, acetoacetate and D3-hydroxybutyrate, all from acetyl-CoA. The brain then begins to consume acetoacetate in place of glucose, and a third of its energy needs are met by ketone bodies, as well as the heart also uses the ketone bodies. After several weeks of starvation, ketone bodies become the major fuel for the brain. Only 40 grams of glucose are required versus the 120 grams that are required on day one. So the body has made a major shift. The synthesis of ketone bodies makes it possible for less protein degradation. When we're on these weeks of starvation, we see 20 grams of muscle per day are lost. Whereas early on, 75 grams of muscle are lost. And yet, when triacylglycerol stores reach zero, only protein remains. And this can lead to death of the organism. To summarize, more triacylglycerol means you can live un longer under starvation conditions. To, to further explain, a lean person would be able to live for about 70 days, whereas an obese person would be able to live for six or seven months. So a person's survival time is mainly determined on the size of their triacylglycerol default. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope the video was helpful. Get, let me know if you have any questions. Big shout out to my girlfriend partner, Morgan, who drew all this beautiful art for me. She's super awesome and was willing to help me because there's nothing else to do in these days of quarantine and social distancing. Like and subscribe. And stay healthy, everyone.